what do we want to do with the sweep rate and the FiO2 when we're warming the patient? We want to increase those, right? We can't get behind on those. We have to be thinking acid-base stacks. We have to be thinking what the patient is telling us. We have to be thinking metabolism is changing. That's why we're cooling and warming these patients. Everybody with me on that? Okay, what, uh, so acid base, we have to switch that. The other thing that that uh, talks to us is about um, flow. How many times have I, in these different labs, talked about what's the most important thing that we can control with the patient? Flow, correct? We've also talked about Passway's equation. We've talked about radius of tubing. We've talked about uh, all the different ways that flow can control acid base status. Again, heating and cooling is a big, a, a big thing that we can control with flow. Flow is the most important factor of the speed at which we heat and cool. So the, the size of our patient is important. The uh, amount of flow going through our pump is vitally important. The type of pump that we're using is important. We had a discussion before lab a little bit about whether or not a centrifugal pump or a roller pump makes any difference when it comes to heating and cooling. We were kind of split down the middle. Some said yes, some said no. Does a roller pump or a centrifugal pump matter? Yes, it matters. Why does it matter? Think about your patient. We've already learned in lab, we've already learned this year, that a roller pump is going to pump at the same speed regardless of the resistance, right? But a centrifugal pump, not so. A centrifugal pump is pressure dependent. When you warm, when you cool, the vasculature in your patient either constricts or dilates. That affects the amount of flow because it affects the amount of resistance that the centrifugal pump is seeing. It's gonna impact the amount of flow going through our centrifugal pump. So when the patient constricts, we have to turn up our RPMs to continue to warm or cool at the same rate. Does that make a difference? Because the number one indicator for increasing or decreasing the speed at which we cool or warm our patient is gonna be the flow through the patient. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, think uh, a little bit more in terms of flow. And as oxygenators and heat exchangers have evolved, we've gotten much better. We've used different types of material. We've used different flow patterns. We've learned that turbulent flow uh, makes a lot greater heat exchange than laminar flow does. If you have garden hose flow through a patient or through an area, the outside edges heat and cool, but not much happens on the inside of that channel. Whereas if you are putting uh, blood through a tubing and you have turbulent flow, that blood is being exposed to a, a membrane of some type that is constantly hitting all of the blood. It's no different than when you heat or cool a soda or a bottle and you take a little tiny can and you put it into the fridge and if you shake it up every now and then, that can is gonna cool or heat at a much greater rate because more of that fluid is going to be exposed to the outer wall of the aluminum. Consequently, if you take a larger can and you just set it in the fridge and you don't touch it, that's gonna cool or warm at a much slower rate. So we've learned those things as perfusion has evolved. So we've learned about the differences in heater coolers. We've learned about the acid base. We've learned about the temperature gradients. We've learned about the difference between roller pumps and centrifugal, centrifugal pumps. We talked about the turbulent or laminar, laminar flow and the flow effects. There are some other things that we need to talk about. These last three are kind of ancillary things when it comes to heating and cooling that we need to be thinking about as perfusionists. Uh, let's talk about the first one, ambient temperatures. We're not the only thing controlling the patient's temperature in the surgery room. So we need to be communicating with the surgeon. We need to be communicating with the anesthesiologist. We need to be communicating with the circulating nurse saying, hey, I'm gonna start cooling now. I'm gonna start warming now. What, can, uh, what do other people control? The overall room temperature. Are they dialing the room temperature up or down so that when, we're, when we reach the appropriate temperature, the patient doesn't automatically start to drift the other direction. There's a thing on the bed called a bed warmer. Sometimes it's called a gamar that's connected to a water bath. Sometimes it's connected to our heater cooler. If you look at the Alpha Omega, there's actually a, a port on that that they can hook the water bed to that they can run cool or warm water that is a topical cooling on the patient's bed. 
Some people actually use ice around the head or ice in the chest for topical cooling. We need to all communicate about those different ambient cooling and heating methods in surgery so that we're all on the same page. So we're not robbing Peter to pay Paul. So we're all on the same page. We're all doing kind of pulling the same direction. The other thing that I want to talk about as far as that is how do we measure our patient temperature? The easiest way is right off the ET tube, a nasopharyngeal temperature probe. That sits right off the ET tube, right uh, down kind of in the, in the pharynx. That tells us what a good temperature is. That's great, except how good is that for telling us what the core temperature of our patient is, especially when we're on bypass, which is when we're gonna heat or cool most of our patients. What does that tell us? That tells us the temperature mainly of what? The head. Well, which organ is gonna get most of the flow when we have auto regulation and we have a cannula sitting in the aorta that's directed mostly right up towards the head. The head, right? So can you see why that really is not the best indicator of what our temperature is gonna be? Maybe a rectal or a bladder temperature would give us a much greater idea of what the core temperature is of that patient. Even our venous blood coming back into our pump, because that's coming from the entire body, is gonna maybe be a better indicator than what our nasopharyngeal temperature is. So that nasopharyngeal temperature is gonna show that we've cooled or heated at a much quicker rate than what the core is actually being heated heat or cooled. Now, some people go and they put a temperature probe on the big toe because that's about as far away from the uh, nasopharyngeal temp probe as you can get. I can buy that. What I would say is don't forget the number one easiest method to tell whether a patient is cool or warm. Our fingers. You can always reach under the drape and you can feel the leg. You can feel the head. You can feel the hand, you can feel the feet. Are we meeting all the different areas and are we heating and cooling this patient appropriately and evenly? Or does the head feel really cool and the, the toes feel just normal or the legs feel normal temperature? If you were to ask me what's the best method of monitoring a patient's temperature, it wouldn't be nasopharyngeal, it wouldn't be rectal or bladder, it wouldn't be using your fingers, it would be using multiple methods to measure. It would be using your fingers. It would be using a nasopharyngeal because it's easy. It would be using a rectal or a bladder probe. It would be having multiple different sites to measure temperature. That gives us the best overall view of whether we're cool or warm. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, the last thing I wanna cover. Everybody good as far as the actual heating and cooling process and how that related to what we saw in the lab, cooling and heating a bucket. The process is not complex. We just have to follow the guidelines that, that, that regulate and dictate what, uh, what the speed at which we want to do this. And if it's something that we plan ahead for, it's, not, it's just going to seem like it's an ancillary part of our duties. It's when we don't and things start going wrong that then our attention is called towards that and it's not being put in the necessary areas like taking care of our patient. The last thing I want to talk about is something that has plagued our profession over the last year or two, and that's cleaning and decontamination of the heater cooling units. This has been a big buzz, a big catchword or catchphrase in our perfusion realm over the last couple years because there have been some cases where they have shown contamination of patients, some, some infections that have been traced back to bacteria in our heater cooler units, and specifically certain heater cooler units with fans that kind of blow and and over, they kind of blow over the water bath. So then, what it happened? What has happened is that's aerosolized or put into air some of that bacteria. We as perfusionists have tried to correct that in a lot of different ways. The first and easiest way is constant cleaning, decontamination of the units. The second way is looking at the internal mechanisms of how these heater coolers work. Another thing that they've done is they've tried to actually relocate the heater cooler into a separate room, say out in the hallway, and just run lines into the room. Well, that becomes really hard to then control the heater cooler unit when it's not right next to the uh, heart and lung machine. So all of these things have not been a perfect fix, but we as perfusionists have looked into what's the actual cause of this. Sometimes it's been as simple as the water system in the hospital is contaminated. 
So everywhere where you get water from has been shown to have mycobacterium or, or some of these different bacteria. But that's something that we as perfusionists need to be on the front end of. And we are actually producing research right here in our school on over the last couple of years on how to best go about these, uh, these mechanisms of cleaning and decontaminating the heater coolers. The best thing overall is constant maintenance. Every day, wipe them, wipe them out, check your lines. Every week, clean these things, add different chemicals, use appropriate disposables that you can add some bleach or car, uh, hydrogen peroxide to to keep the water lines clear. Make sure uh, different vendors have different products that allow you to add those things to the, without those those chemicals crossing the barrier into the blood. So again, you need to be aware of what you're using and we need to make sure and stay on top of the decontamination and the cleaning of these, uh, these devices. So anyway, heating and cooling our patients. It's really an important part of what it is that we do. If you guys have any questions or anything like that, we can, uh, we can deal with those.